So thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very glad to speak over here. As you learned, I'm not a computer scientist. Uh, I consider myself a complexity scientist, but I will explain why this is important also for computer science. And um, obviously, Future ICT is a flagship project that's going to compete with other flagships uh, for the European flagship call in the area of future emerging technologies. That is a call in the area of information and communication technologies. And so on board of our consortium are dozens, if not hundreds, of computer scientists. Um, you will be able to meet them at a variety of conferences and so on. And if you have really technical questions, then uh, they are the ones to be asked. Uh, but I try to give you over here a general vision and overview of the project. And hopefully I can inspire you also to uh, address a number of challenging problems that not only science has to tackle in the future, but also humanity has to tackle. The European Commission has been asking for big science projects, actually of the scale of Apollo projects. Apollo, of course, was still bigger than that, but in principle we're talking about big science and 10 years programs that require federated projects. And um, as you know, um, there are a number of competitors and Future ICT is the only project that is addressing the socio-economic and technological challenges of the 21st century that we have to address. And that also comes with a paradigm shift in the way to think about this world. So there are a number of old problems and uh, we used to think about threats to society as being external threats such as wars, terrorism, and so on. Uh, trying to convince you that there are also internal threats coming from the nature of complex systems and if you don't design them well, then they will be unstable through the interaction of components. In fact, we are facing a number of new or intensified global problems. And uh, the financial crisis is actually one of the crises we need to worry most about at this moment because it can really impact not only the economy and have impacts on our savings, but that can have a big impact on society as well. It could destabilize societies, it could uh, increase uh, crime, it could uh, promote political extremism, it could in the worst case endanger even our cultural heritage that we have built up over decades and longer time periods. So we need to worry about that quite a bit and we need to understand the financial crisis much better. And as you know, financial systems these days are very much based on extremely powerful ICT systems. Most of the financial trades these days are done by supercomputers. And then of course, uh, there are environmental challenges, there are political instabilities as we're seeing them at the moment in some Arabic states. There is crime and cyber crime and the quick spreading of emerging diseases and what uh, the project overall wants to uh, gain is a better understanding of society and in fact all socially interactive systems and I should add right now that future information communication systems are basically socially interactive systems. That's why I will argue social sciences are crucial to really design those future ICT systems. So we want to better understand those socially interactive systems and its dependency of, on main driving factors such as resources and so on. Unfortunately, our knowledge of global techno-socioeconomic systems today is quite limited and there is a quote of Jean-Claude uh, Claude Trichet when he was uh, president of the European Central Bank. Uh, he said, when the crisis came, the serious limitations of existing economic and financial models immediately became apparent. 
we felt abandoned by conventional tools. And let me add that we also don't have a science of the global information and communication technologies around. And in principle, as the financial system has broken down, the same could happen also to information communication technologies. In fact, we are changing, we are, we are facing novel challenges. And one of the reasons is technological change that we have seen at a rapid pace in the past years, but also globalization. And here is a quote by Lizzie Bollinger, as president of Columbia University, he said that the forces affecting societies around the world are powerful and novel. The spread of global market systems are reshaping our world and raising profound questions. These questions call for the kinds of analysis and understandings that academic institutions are uniquely capable of providing. I mean, it's our responsibility to come up with this knowledge. And he says, too many policy failures are fundamentally failures of knowledge. And I fully agree, we don't have the system science that we need really to understand global systems. To have an authoritative voice from the technology side, I'm citing Sandy Pentland of MIT Media Lab. He says, our financial transportation health system are broken. We need to develop a decentralized adaptive approach in order to have new solutions. And managing the complexity of today's systems requires real-time data mining. Many of the global challenges result from cascading effects. Cascading effects uh, that um, are resulting because we have created network infrastructures that are not only facilitating new functionalities and services, but also they create pathways for disaster spreading. We now have a global exchange of people, money, good information and ideas, and uh, globalization, technological change have actually created a strongly coupled and interdependent world and I will explain you later on that besides cascading effects that can potentially occur on a global scale, there are a number of other important implications that allow us to understand how dramatically the world has changed and why the conventional wisdom is failing to solve these problems. Here are just a number of examples for cascading effects, such as uh, blackouts in the power grid in November 4, 2006, it happened that one line was turned off, taken off the net in order to allow the transfer of a ship. Of course, that has been simulated before, but that simulation didn't take into account the possibility of a, a random failure of another line. And as a consequence of that happening, there were blackouts all over Europe not only in Germany, even in Portugal. And you can see this quite complex pattern of blackouts, which is typical actually for the behavior of complex systems. Of course, we have seen similar cascading effects in information communication infrastructures. Skype system, for example, has suffered a cascading effect, so just to mention one famous example. But we also see these cascading effects in financial markets. In fact, it all started off with the American subprime crisis, and that was quite substantial, but it was 25 times smaller than the losses we have to deal with today that resulted basically from a situation of responding too late to the problems that uh, the financial crisis has implied. So we hear that uh, in the political circles we're discussing about bigger and bigger safety measures in order to save the euro. And so this cascading effect is still ongoing and 
it's not quite clear whether we can really cover the cost in the end and what implications that has. Actually, the cascading effect is well demonstrated also by this video here created by Frank Schweitzer's team at ETH Zurich, and you can see that it's almost like a thunderstorm in a summer night how banks are failing. So the failing of one bank has impacts on other banks and that eventually causes that hundreds of banks have died in the United States already and the process hasn't been finished. Revolutions are just. Another example of cascading effects um, have been called Twitter and Facebook revolutions. Um, I would actually question that a bit. I would believe that Twitter and Facebook uh, may actually have um, accelerated an overdue transition. So they have acted like a catalyst, but they have not caused the revolution, I would say. And why am I claiming that? Because there are some economic and also social factors that seem to determine a transition from hierarchical systems, autocracies, to democratic systems. And you can see uh, when we show the GDP per person in US dollar over the fertility I mean children per woman, then there is this clear separation line between autocracies and democracies. Uh, and from that point of view, actually, the transitions in Arab big states have been overdue. And similar cascading effects have been seen already in Europe, where democracies have more and more spread over decades. Um, so there is, again, an influence on one event on another, like a domino effect, and that creates those cascades. And here is another evidence, actually, that not Twitter and Facebook has caused the uh, revolutions, namely food prices, and shown together with the social unrest that have occurred in a number of different countries. And it's quite clear that those unrests happened at times when people really had problems to pay for food. Now, these high food prices are partially a result of financial speculation, but also of other events, such as uh, attempts to reduce global warming. So we are producing biofuels in order to do that. And this biofuel production is in competition with food production, has increased food prices, which, as I said, was further amplified by a financial speculation. So we have cross-sectional cascading effects over here, uh, which are more and more important in really every um, global issue. And here, another example, conflict, in the Middle East, in that case in Jerusalem, and you can see those violent events tend to trigger off other violent events in the neighborhood. So there is a course and effect relationship and also an escalation dynamics that we can actually see that follows certain statistical laws. Those laws can be fed into multi-agent computer simulations and so on in order to understand what is going on. I will come back to this later on. And finally, here is an illustration of a quite general approach towards understanding disasters spreading because many disasters start with local problems, a local perturbation, an overload of a system, which then affects other systems or other system components, and this way triggering a cascading effect. And um, if we determine, based on historical examples, these causal interdependencies, then we can actually predict likely courses of events. So, for example, when there is an earthquake, in a country that is close uh, to a coastline, 
Uh, then there is a high chance of a tsunami happening. There can be also landslides and other related events. We know that infrastructure will be destroyed. For example, gas pipelines that will create fires. Those fires cannot be easily extinguished because um, it turns out that roads are destroyed. And so there are really a number of issues. Um, people are separated somehow, cannot be reached, so diseases could uh, spread and all these kind of things. And in the end also, there can be political impacts. And when I gave my first interview after this terrible disaster, earthquake disaster in Japan, I've already indicated two days later that that would have an impact on political discussions in Europe and see what happened now in Germany and Switzerland. It was decided to uh, get out of nuclear power production and all of this can be understood based on these causal interdependencies. The question is just, you know, where does this cascading stop and where can we stop it? Now actually these kinds of pictures can help us to stop it earlier than it, al it allows us to anticipate possible events, as I said before, which means that we can take proactive measures to protect the next uh, endangered uh, areas from being hit by the cascading effects rather than running behind the course of events and uh, try to repair when something has already gone wrong. Now besides cascading effects I indicated there are a number of other problems because we have created strongly coupled and complex systems. And uh, if you have a physics background in particular in complex systems then you know that there is a phenomenon that we call phase transitions and phase transitions means that there can be a systemic shift which comes with dramatically changed behaviors of the system. In many cases we talk about emergent behavior, these behaviors of the system can be quite surprising, very unexpected in fact. And so what I'm claiming is that making now systems more and more interdependent by networking them will or has even already caused a phase transition to a completely different system behavior that we need to understand in order really to come up with the right solutions because that will create new kinds of problems and requires different kinds of solutions. So networking the system does not just gradually change the system. There would be the point where the system behavior would change fundamentally. And this is what you need to know. So in many of those systems that we have created, there is no strict system optimization possible anymore in real time, not even with supercomputers. That is a result of the NP completeness of the problem. Uh, we observe in those strongly coupled systems a faster dynamics and increased frequency of extreme events. Unfortunately, these events can have any size, in particular global size. In those strongly coupled systems, predictability goes down. Complex systems, we find unwanted feedback, cascade and side effects, and often counterintuitive behavior. Self organization takes over and strong correlations dominate the system dynamics. That means the properties of the system components don't anymore characterize the system behavior. You would think that basically you design the system by designing the components and the system is characterized by the properties of the components. This is actually true for weakly coupled systems. But as you couple them strongly it will start to have properties that you didn't expect and that might be extremely undesirable. We have seen that actually in 
electronics of car systems where each of the new assistance systems has been perfectly designed in separation, perfectly tested and everything, but if you plug these different systems together and they interact with a bus system in, in the car, then suddenly the car may behave in unexpected ways and stop in the middle of the road as it happened to me actually and to many other people because those interaction effects uh, produce unexpected results. Because of this self-organization and the eigendynamics of these systems, there are very limited possibilities for external control. There are larger vulnerabilities to random failures and external shocks and as a result of that, there is a loss of trust in public and private institutions. Well, if you look around into our world and read the newspapers regularly, then you'll find that our world has all these features. That means the problem why we have difficulties dealing with a number of challenges is due to a wrong perspective on these systems. We tend to have a component rather than an interaction-oriented view and that's why we need a science of multi-level complex systems because this complexity science is actually focusing on the interactions and the result of the interactions. Here is an example of a strongly coupled system. A single local event can have an impact on the global system. So these are table tennis balls on mouse traps, and you can see that can really mess up all the system. Um, and so the question is, if we have created these strongly coupled systems, did we happen to create something like a global time bomb? And I was a bit puzzled by this idea when I had it for the first time, and so maybe that's a bit too far. But in fact, I found this article by Warren Buffett, who is one of the richest people in the world, I think richest or second richest, who knows about how the world works, I would say. And already in 2003, he has given an interview to BBC where he warned of the investment time bomb that we have created by derivatives. He's speaking about weapons of mass destruction and that this could actually imply mega catastrophic risk for the economy as we are facing them now, eight years later. There is another book, by the way, of the internet as a time bomb. And uh, so the whole thing also applies to other network systems. And uh, why do we need uh, to be worried? Because, well, in, in principle, the ICT systems that we are creating are also, in some sense, socially interactive systems. They're becoming more and more artificial social systems. Why is that? Because there are millions and even billions of interacting components. Many of them take autonomous decisions. And um, that basically characterizes uh, social systems. Um, many of these components make a picture of the outside world and respond to the future expectation of what will happen. A typical example are trading computers. Uh, all the high frequency trading is done by computers. More than 50% is done by computers. Um, and it's exactly this kind of phenomenon I'm talking about. So these are artificial social systems in principle. But they have not been designed and tested for the collective behavior of their components. And so we could see a lack of coordination, instabilities, an inefficient use of resources, conflicts of interest, cybercrime and cyber war as a result, because these are all the problems we have in our real society. So in order to create well-functioning ICT systems of the future, we need to understand socially interactive systems. We need social science in order to come up with good solutions because we're absolutely dependent these days on reliable ICT systems. 
And here is one simulation that hopefully is eye-opening. This is simulating a social dilemma situation as we're facing it many times. People can cooperate or not. If they not cooperate, then it's presented in red. If they cooperate in blue, if they have neighborhood interactions, then this is promoting cooperation in the system. So blue is good, this is what we want, but now we're going to start networking the system more and more and more and more. And as you will see, when this networking exceeds a certain threshold, it's not beneficial for the system anymore, but cooperation starts to break down. And I'm claiming that this is a likely course of the financial crisis because it happened then over the years. We have moved from a regional banking system where we had a connection with regional banks mostly to a strongly connected system where every bank is interlinked with any other bank basically and we have created a global village exactly of this kind as it's shown over here. So the breakdown of cooperation is the expected outcome. If you find this too theoretical, I have two other examples that show you that creating stronger interactions can actually change the system behavior completely. We can create, for example, traffic breakdown. So we hear drivers are advised to drive as continuously as they can, of course, without accidents. But you'll see in a few seconds that they cannot maintain this continuous flow. And what happens is that there is a traffic jam that occurred, which they don't get rid of anymore. So the efficiency of the system has been lost because of an internal instability. If you would ask them what was the reason for that, everybody would say because it was a stupid driver in front of me, but everybody would say that. Under normal conditions, pedestrians are organizing very well. You can see over here, they are forming these lanes of uniform walking direction, and they're separating the different flow directions in a way that allows smooth walking without a lot of stopping, actually. So that's an example of self-organization that works very well, like an invisible hand kind of self-organization phenomenon as we claim to have it in our markets. But in fact, here is another example of what goes wrong when the density is too high. So we can have crowd disasters and all the coordination in crowd can break down if the system becomes too strongly coupled. So there is some good reasons to believe that actually strong coupling in the system could be stabil uh, destabilize the systems. And I'm not sure whether political decision makers, economic decision makers, or even most scientists are aware of this fact or have ever thought about it. That's why it's so serious. But for now, you must think, okay, complex systems must be really a bad thing. Uh, but we can also use complexity for ourselves. In fact, it turns out that if we uh, approach them in the right way, and we go away from a purely hierarchically organized structure towards a flexible, adaptive approach that is using self-organization in the system to get towards a desirable solution. That means if we basically facilitate self-organization and support it, then that can be an extremely efficient approach. And in this way, we have learned how to avoid crowd disasters. So there was a project in Mecca that learned uh, how to redesign the interactions in the system, how to use real-time flow monitoring data, how to come up with new management approaches, 
such as adaptive rerouting and so on, in order to get towards a resilient flow organization that worked very well since then, although I'm not anymore involved in this. We've also simulated conflict in Jerusalem with an agent-based approach, and it allows us to understand, actually, the conflict patterns in the city. Moreover, it allows us also to compare different political scenarios. So we can find out what political scenario would create more conflict, most likely, than other political scenarios. So we can find solutions to very old and very worrying problems. We know that this is a conflict that has impact on the rest of the world. So we really need to find solutions for this. And also we found solutions to traffic jams. What did we do over here? Basically also applied an adaptive approach. This, at the moment we're still seeing a stop and go waves that are created by today's interactions of cars, but with driver assistance system we can change those interactions. And I will turn on a traffic assistance system now, which changes those interactions a little bit, and thereby stabilizes traffic flows and increases the capacity. And we can even get rid of this congestion, although the inflows into the system stay the same. So there are new solutions. And by the way, here, a decentralized solution approach to very old problems. And we can do a similar thing for urban traffic. Classically, we have this brute force approach with a very expensive traffic center with supercomputers in it, collects a lot of data, but then there is this NP-complete optimization problem and simplifications have to be made and it turns out that the control is not very satisfactory. There are many people complaining about traffic congestion, as you know. We have developed a completely different approach, a decentralized bottom-up self-organization. That means we're using interactions, we're defining interactions in the system that would create local coordination and this local coordination would spread itself in the system to create a better performance. I mean, we are really employing self-organization in order to solve the problem. Here, in order to do so, we not only measure the outflow, but also the inflow to facilitate short-term anticipation of uh, groups of vehicles arriving because you want to give them a green light. And uh, in principle, it's the traffic flows that control the traffic lights rather than imposing by the supercomputing center um, a traffic organization centrally as we did it in the past. So in this way we can reach a better use of scarce resources as you can see over here. All the modes of transport are profiting and also the environment. So I've shown you a number of examples where we have solved really old problems better solution. I'm not saying that we can get rid of all congestion or, or conflict, but we can reach 10, 20, 30 percent of improvement. And uh, I will argue later on that this really has an enormous value for society. Now, Future ICT wants to scale up the success stories to a global scale through something like an Apollo program. Uh, we want to get into a position really to catch up with the pace at which new problems are coming up. And in order to get there, we need to put together engineers with natural scientists and social scientists. That's what we are claiming, and in particular, it's very important to have information communication technology and board social sciences and complexity science in order to reach scientific, technological, and social societal outcomes that are favorable. This is the structure of the project. So it has a number of different focus areas, uh, research focuses as indicated over here. You can see there is quite some complexity in order to uh, cope with the complexity of our real world. 
but we will organize this project knowing about how complex systems behave and we will apply the corresponding management concepts. So first of all we want to create so-called observatories that will allow us to detect opportunities and threats to certain areas of society, economy, technology, environment and so on and so on. So observatories of finance, of supply chains, of health, of uh, demography, conflict and war, crime and corruption, all these kind of things. So, and we'll talk about later where to get all the data from because this is uh, really an important challenge. But um, as I said, there will be these observatories that allow us to get a better spatial, temporal and network picture of the world in real time in order to be better informed and take better decisions. And uh, the approach is that we would start with competence clusters with excellent centers that are built around really fantastic experts that have done work in one of these areas before and built up already supercomputing for transport, for example, like Kai Axhausen is doing it, or um, an analysis of uh, data of uh, crime or war and these kind of things and then we would successively integrate these activities to create these exploratories of society, economy and so on and so on. And finally create the future ICT platform um, by the year 10. And in order to facilitate that we basically have to bring together heterogeneous data of all kinds um, visualization platforms uh, with models and theories and also with interactive participatory elements. And I'll go into more detail now. So Future ICT wants to create new instruments to understand problems better than today. So it's not going to be this fantastic supercomputer that in the end has the answer and tells politicians what to do on that it says 42 or something like that. Now it will be an instrument like a telescope or a microscope to look at a problem more closely from various perspectives and everybody could use it. So it's not just for politicians and a few economic leaders, it's supposed to be a, uh, instrument for everybody, like everybody is using the internet today. So there will be the living earth simulator to model and forecast. There will be really a supercomputing approach, but there could be a, actually a decentralized approach. So people could do simulation efforts in different countries who could be zoom in and out, which would change the degree of detail. And of course, we don't want to, to model the flea on the dock of somebody, but uh, we really want to understand how the economy impacts society, how the economy impacts the environment and these kinds of things. I mean, macroscopic interdependencies and here, it's the art of science is the art of approximation. We don't, we don't want a one-to-one -one picture. We want uh, a picture one to a hundred thousand, one to whatever. So there is aggregation. We don't want to follow individuals. We want to understand the aggregated interdependencies. But still for this we require a lot of data and where would those data come from? Well, we imagine this to come from what we call the planetary nervous system. Uh, I will tell you later why we call it like this. Uh, in principle, this is a sensor network where a sensor is anything that collects data about techno socioeconomic system, preferably in real time. So uh, anything that allows to measure the state of the world and uh, also we want to create it in a way that allows us to understand the state of the world. Um, and then finally there will be this global participatory platform 
But before I come into to this, uh, let me go into more detail of the planetary nervous system, which will really benefit from the many data sources that recently became available and have been missing in the past and obstructing breakthroughs in the social sciences that we expect for the near future. So there's remote sensing, there's the internet, satellites, telecommunication, prediction market, GPS data, Web 2.0, um, serious games, and sensor networks, and all these kinds of things. All of this creates data that allow us to learn something about techno socio economic systems. And in fact, uh, we can build up a sensor network ourselves using uh, all the sensors that smartphones and many of you, um, I bet, uh, are using that, that are part of these smartphones. So there's, um, for example, GPS sensors, uh, there's microphones, cameras, and so on and so on. Of course, the question is how to use these sensors in a way that would not damage privacy and um, how to create a planetary nervous system. The MIT has been working quite a bit on these kind of things and we are collaborating with them. Um, so the, the overall goal is to measure the state of the world in real time. And um, certainly through those uh, smartphones we could establish a global sensor network and uh, in order for this to work well, we need to have incentives to voluntarily provide data and that would, uh, would be mainly aggregated data that would not reveal too much. Uh, for example, we could use these mobile phones in order to get a picture of the noise landscape in Zurich and all Switzerland. Yeah? So, that is the way we could use uh, microphones, not to record what people are saying, but to get a picture of how noisy is our environment. Um, and of course, it's very important uh, to provide users control over their own data, to develop new technologies, uh, to do a privacy respecting data mining. All of that is needed, and obviously we need to anonymize and aggregate data on the fly. But there are already examples for this working well. OpenStreetMap is using such a decentralized data gathering principle. And also there is an earthquake sensing and warning system that has been proposed. But we could go further than that. Actually, combining all the data would allow us uh, to come up with what individuals have, but our world doesn't have, which is self-awareness. Self-awareness really helps us to anticipate possible consequences of our decisions and actions, and it helps us to detect possible threats and opportunities. In other words, to avoid mistakes. And that will allow us to create also new compasses for decision makers. So the goal is to create indices better than GDP, considering health, environment, happiness, and so on, to promote the sustainability of these systems. In fact, our society is built on many things that we call social capital, which are hard to measure, but are crucial for the well-being of our society. And here are just a number of these variables. So, in order to protect our society from damaging the fabric of society, it's very important that we become able to measure this state of society, to measure social capital. Of course, simulization and visualization is important and most likely the ETH cupola will be used for such a simulization, uh, visualization dome. And uh, I was also mentioning these participatory platforms and uh, one possible application of this is to create interactive virtual worlds that would allow us to interact with in more or less realistic of our uh, copies of our society in a virtual setting. And in this way explore 
what results from the interaction of individuals under certain institutional boundary conditions. Because I told you before, in complex systems, it's the interactions that determine the outcome. Um, so we could, for example, have several parallel worlds, series, multiplayer online games, basically, in which um, we have different financial architectures implemented and see what results from these different financial architectures. Will we have a more stable or a less stable system? Now, I also tell, told you that basically for complex systems, the right approach is to have more bottom-up elements. And that also means a bottom-up approach for our democracies and it does more participation of people and uh, we envisage that we should overcome in our society black holes for data and data fragmentation so we should have a data platform which is open for everybody uh, with transparent data sources and quality transparent algorithms and transparent results and uh, transparent, responsible use. Basically, we want to create a new public good, like air is one, or our environment, language, or culture, and that will facilitate new services and jobs. It will reduce barriers for social, economic, and political participation, and enable an age of creativity. The problem, however, is that we need mechanisms to avoid data pollution, manipulation, misuse, privacy intrusion, and cybercrime, and that requires a new internet, a new web, uh, self-regulating information ecosystem. And so what would be parts of such a trustable web? The elements would be ownership and control of users over their data. We would need uh, privacy respecting information systems. Um, we need to think about how to reach responsible use. We require a decentralized, transparent, and manipulation resistant reputation system for information contents and providers because that reputation system will stabilize cooperative behavior as we know it from game theory. I will show you examples. So the principle is to come up with a self-organizing and self-regulating system, something like a socially adaptive, mutually beneficial information ecosystem. But in order to design it, we need to understand social systems well. OK, there, there will be a lot of benefits given the costs that uh, all these problems cause to society. So many of them cause society trillions of losses every year. So even a 1% improvement or less of those problems would really make the, pay off, uh, the, the project pay off multiple times. And the idea is we'd work a little bit similar to weather forecasts, which we now work only short term and also are not reliable, but still, even though everybody is investing 10 Swiss francs, uh, which is actually more than our project will cost, it, will cre it creates a five times higher benefit. And uh, also there is uh, potential through new social, uh, social inspired technologies. And uh, Facebook gives you just one example of the potential of social inspired ideas. Uh, in fact, there are a lot of interesting features of social systems, uh, such as conflict resolution, trust, reputation, innovation, culture, and so on. So it would be nice to have such systems also in future ICT systems and use them for us. And there's still some stuff to be done. There are already, of course, some applications. So there's form intelligence, wisdom of crowds, and these kind of things. There's uh, social sensing, uh, as it can be applied also to traffic control. Uh, we need to think about ethical ICT systems, how to design uh, them in a way that have ethics considered by design. We could come up with new ways to support the understanding of people with different cultural backgrounds. 
in this way, uh, way overcoming many of the integration problems that we are having today. And I would even propose that we should have something like what I call social money. I mean, money that uh, has a memory, which has a history, which has a reputation. And if I had more time, I would explain you why that would uh, solve the currency crisis that we are having in Europe at the moment. So there are quite a number of uh, interesting systems that we can create inspired by society and the mechanisms behind it. And here's one example, peer-to-peer -peer systems. Um, we know that peer-to-peer -peer systems work in a different way to classical client service systems. So um, basically it's a decentralized system and the interesting point is while classical systems uh, work worse when uh, there are more users using it, um, these um, peer-to-peer -peer systems work better with more users. But there is a public goods problem behind it. The system works only well if people provide storage capacity, bandwidth, and content. So it's a really social dilemma situation where we know that it's tempting not to cooperate. It's tempting to take the service and walk away. And so the problem is how do we uh, get towards a, a high service quality in these kinds of systems? And we can learn from game theory over here. There are a number of different mechanisms that are promoting cooperation, as we know, such as uh, genetic inheritance, uh, repeated interactions, reputation mechanisms, uh, neighborhood interactions, and so on and so on. And tit for tat strategies, as they're actually also applied in these kinds of systems to promote cooperation. But besides that, there are new mechanisms, um, such as um, migration dynamics that mean mobility that allows people to walk away from uh, communities that are not very cooperative towards areas that are more cooperative and then we find this very surprising situation that even starting with everybody defecting we could eventually get the outbreak of cooperation, it means a sudden increase in the performance of the system resulting from the interaction of individuals. So we can see here that by random coincidence, after a very long time actually, there happened to be a cooperative cluster. And this cooperation now is spreading more and more in the system increasing the system performance on average and also uh, for all the individuals. So everybody is better off in that system and that is just the opposite uh, to the situation which is usually expected for the system which is a breakdown of cooperation. So if you choose the right interactions in the system you would promote cooperation to happen by itself. And with this, I'd like to conclude and say future ICT is big science. It's published in the best journals. It will fill a lot of knowledge gaps. It will come up with interesting ICT, like open data platforms, privacy respecting data mining technologies, a trustable web, ethical ICT, and so on and so on. But altogether, we need to change our thinking about the systems that we have created. We are not anymore facing well-controllable systems which are characterized by the uh, properties of the system components and which are well-controllable in a top-down fashion. No, we are living in a world um, with a complex system behavior, with emerging collective behaviors, uh, a low degree of uh, predictability, difficulties to control them from the outside, and counterintuitive behavior, also extreme events. Now systems can be better approached by facilitating a favorable self-organization. For this, it's important to choose the right interactions in the system. And I believe that will really change our view of the world. 
because our current view is focused on the components of the system, which is the visible part of our world. This paradigm shift requires us to focus our attention on the mostly invisible and hard to measure interactions in the system. So somehow it's a paradigm shift which might be compared to the paradigm shift from a geocentric to a heliocentrical world view because it really requires a different perspective on the system. Well, if we create these different perspectives, it will allow us to find new solutions. Thank you very much. And there was one question over there. No? Yeah, so, I mean, if I w w would go into this, obviously I would uh, take um, a lot of time, and this is what, what I can offer to, to those people who are interested in the subject in the courses. I have a course on From Crowds to Crisis this semester, which is addressing these kinds of questions specifically, and next semester one on traffic flow dynamics where we provide all the mathematics of those phenomena and how they come about and how to um, develop solutions to fight congestion and so on. So as I indicated, um, the solution approach is oriented at the interactions. So in, in order to solve a problem such as, uh, for example, the urban traffic flow control problem, uh, you basically need to vary the interaction between the system components, in this case in cars with traffic lights and tra in, uh, neighboring traffic lights. You could do that in a systematic way as we have done it with uh, you know, rigorous thinking, a lot of mathematics and with a very difficult approach or you could do that in an evolutionary way, basically allow those interactions to evolve. As we have done it in, uh, for example, some computer simulations of pedestrians where we allow pedestrians to learn how to interact with each other. I know that this is a problem that is uh, interesting for, um, for artificial intelligence people because there are quite a few uh, people from these groups who are now asking me about how to do robot control based on what we learned about pedestrian behavior. We have very good models of how pedestrians steer through a crowd successfully and efficiently and these kind of things. So these things can be applied to modern robotics and these kind of things. So there are really a, a number of I interesting new um, approaches and, and solutions, I would say. And uh, what, what generally really needs to be developed is a better understanding of systemic behaviors resulting from these interactions. I'm, uh, Well, first of all, you know, if we n go on networking a system, we need to consider that those network links that we are creating are also creating um, the possibility for bad things to propagate. And just take it as a, as a truth that, that it will sooner or later happen. Uh, given that, we need to design uh, systems in a way that have decoupling strategies inbuilt, such as we have uh, fuses in our electrical networks at home to uh, basically limit 
problems in the network to locally and avoid that it would uh, affect the whole system, a bigger system at least. Um, for similar reasons, we have firewalls, for example, uh, but we didn't have such an approach uh, implemented in our financial system, and that's actually why cascading effects were possible uh, to that extent, and why we have so big problems at the moment. We didn't have the decoupling strategies. Now, there is a lot of political discussion about separating investment banks, uh, for example, which would be a decoupling strategy, and certainly we need more of this kind. But this is exactly what I am talking about. We need to consider the bad sides of uh, networks spreading while we are constructing these networks in order to to be prepared to, to avoid worst case scenarios, a global spreading of problems. Yes, there's. Basically what I'm saying is we should go back to the bomb control systems of the past. No, I, I mean, certainly that, that would be one possibility, but not a very realistic one, I would say. Well, This is um, actually what some, some economists are now thinking that uh, we're going back from the trend of globalization towards uh, more regionalized economies again. But I'm saying this is one approach, but it's not necessarily the only approach because um, uh, let's go back to this uh, problem of uh, social cooperation again where I have indicated through simulation that too much networking would endanger cooperation. Now, you could say, okay, let's go back to neighborhood interaction then, because that solved the problem, but there are other solutions. And actually, there are two trends at the moment uh, in the world. One is more surveillance and punishment. Yeah, that's why we have cameras everywhere. And governments feel that systems are destabilizing, so you know, they put new powers in, in place in, in order to control the system. But I think that will end up in a system that people don't like too much, and also I, I don't think this can be centrally controlled, because uh, if we cannot control a financial system, how should we control an even more complex system, such as the society or the internet or so? There is another trend, however, which is more and more rating and reputation systems. So now we see that uh, we have these rating platforms almost everywhere. We can rate articles, products, companies, and so on and so on. And that is known to stabilize cooperation. So we are finding new mechanisms, basically, to stabilize also a globally networked society, but it requires new mechanism. And in particular, one of the mechanisms that I propose is also to have just a, 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 for these kind of serious spreading scenarios, a decoupling strategy that allows you to cut off parts of the system, and which would, in fact, then for the time being, re regionalize the problem, contain the problem, um, until things recover and we can uh, come back to uh, a, a cooperative and well-coordinated system. But we certainly need to have these mechanisms in place. Right. And this is actually what Future ICT is doing, is bringing together those different communities. So we have about 50% ICT people, and we have about 50% complexity science people and social science people. And you bring them together in the same workshops to talk to each other. And it turns out often they have different perspectives, but over time, 
over those discussions, we have basically developed a, a common ground. So really, one serious challenge for society results also from the fact that we're collecting so much data about individuals. And uh, that is threatening potentially our democracies. Because now in the hands of a single company, there are more data about every single individual than any secret service in the world ever had about individuals. So if it's in the hands of the wrong individuals, that will be potentially extremely bad. And for sure, as people who want to be in power see the potential of these data, sooner or later, these data will be in the wrong hands. I mean, the mafia can easily buy companies that own big data about people and what is going to happen then. So we need to worry about it before a serious event happens before we are surprised by a misuse of social data on a large scale. But we neither have the laws in place nor do we have the technology really to do a privacy respecting data mining which is taking into account individual interests, business interests and public interests. I have not seen the solution. Yeah? And I think this is really crucial. As I think it's crucial to have a global universal <coughs> rating and reputation system, which is, by the way, multi-criterial, multi-dimensional, not one-dimensional. A one-dimensional system can be very bad for society again. And it should be decentralized. I mean, it should not be in the hand of one country or one company or so, it should be a fully decentralized reputation system basically based on peer-to-peer -peer systems. So I wonder where do we have those systems which I think are really crucial for society. Our internet is working less and less well, we know that. We have more and more cybercrime, it's exponentially imploding, uh, exploding because our internet has not been created for today's applications. So it's not properly designed for this and we need to come up with a proper design. You can read articles by ICT experts saying, okay, we need to redo the system and I fully agree. Yes. Well, as I said, in principle, we have new methods to experiment as well. And these uh, multiplayer online worlds, the virtual interactive worlds that I mentioned before, are such an experimental environment where you can test certain things. Besides that, of course, certain uh, things can be tested in computer simulations as well. And I think we will be getting there, that we can measure these things in a systematic way as we learn to, to um, do experiment and very sophisticated experiments, by the way, in, in other areas um, of our world. Like physics and uh, biological experiments are not simple experiments. Some of them, many of them are much more complicated than any experiment we're doing in the social sciences today. So. We do now have uh, a lab to do behavioral experiments. We do also web experiments and these kind of things. But new things, new opportunities are coming up here. Yes.
This is a very valid question and, and actually that's why we need to have this very close interaction between theoretical approaches, simulation-based approaches, experimental approaches and also these interactive platforms that we have mentioned. You know. So whenever a simulation is done, we should not just believe this, but we should then go on and test this in the lab or in some other environment to verify and maybe discover deviations between our simulations and what is happening in experiments to learn how to model this better. As we have done that, for example, in the area of traffic and pedestrian modeling, very successfully. So by now we have an analytical theory even of uh, the most important properties of traffic flows. It's a complicated series. It has about a thousand or two thousand formulas to derive everything, but it's available now after you know, about 10 years after we started uh, traffic research. And it was very important that data became available in the meantime. So there is a systematics that one can apply in order to learn this and you always start kind of with approximations uh, which some, and maybe sometimes with wrong approaches that need to be corrected over time. But the same is true for weather forecasts for example. Weather forecasts 10 years ago were terrible in terms of their quality. Today they're astonishingly reliable. They're not, they will never be perfect. But uh, you know, we have learned how to improve weather forecasts by putting more sensors in our environment in the right places and also having more powerful uh, computer simulations coupled to these sensors and the same thing will happen in social sciences. We'll have to start it one day and this is the day basically and, and we get better and better and better by joint forces from people all over the world.